Hi, um, Max and Marco are next two speakers. They're a little concerned that they won't manage to get all of their amazing content into the confines of this 45 minute slot. So we're gonna kick them off just a few minutes early. Just to reiterate uh, what they said a few moments ago, if you're sitting towards the back of the room, you might wanna come forward so that you can see all of that amazing content. Over all right. to you guys. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thank you everyone for coming through. Um, of course, it's the, you know, we're kind of into the, the last part of the day, so this is when you need to have the longest, you know, session so you can really concentrate a lot because this is definitely the time to do it after you've eaten and uh, it's a Friday afternoon. We're going to be talking today about a salt stack. We're from a company called Think Supplied Research. Uh, it turns out everyone is hiring here. We're not hiring. I'm kidding. We are hiring. If you want to come and speak to me, uh, come chat. But actually, we're just here to really talk about salt uh, and what we've we've done with it. The reason we got into salt is because we actually do a product called Canary and, and we come out of a security consulting background. So I usually say we're not developers, although we've got a team of developers in the sense that our heritage is security consultants and we now try to make security products. And the big one that we do is this thing called uh, Canary. Canary is a small hardware uh, honeypot. It's also got virtual versions. Um, but the thing here is that uh, we've got a bunch of thousands of devices. They sit with customers um, and our customers have, uh, we, we've got over 400 customers on it and they each get their own server. And we need to start to manage that stuff. Um, Andrew mentioned uh, we've got a lot of content so uh, we'll keep going through. Um, in terms of what we'll talk about today with Salt, um, our, uh, the hacking that we do on Salt Stack um, is by all of the guys in the team. So there's five of us. Um, as a Jay and Nick are not here today, but they certainly had a, a large part in uh, constructing what we do uh, with SALT. And so there's really three things that I'm going to uh, try and embed in you and, and try and get you to take away uh, from the talk today. And that's sort of three concepts around extending SALT. Um, and that's the idea of execution modules, runners, and reactors. And by the end of the talk, hopefully you'll have a stronger idea of what those are. Um, and... and in terms of why we're doing this, it's really about uh, making salt or helping salt, rather helping us uh, manage our devices and our consoles in a way that uh, would be much more hard if, it, if we had to do this stuff, uh, if we had to do this stuff manually. So we're not looking to extend salt generically. We're not looking to add new platforms to salt or new uh, system commands to salt. We want to extend salt so it makes our lives easier when it comes to managing our fleet of customer service. So this is the, the quick map that you'll have of the talk today. There's eight broad areas that we're going to get into. Um, and I'm going to talk background first. Who recognizes that? Oh, that's not bad. Nice. So uh, old Sun server, uh, a stately, glorious machine if you've ever worked on one of them. Um, and uh, at the time when you, when you worked on those, you had limited number of those sorts of servers, right? Because they were big, they were expensive. Um, and really the biggest problem you had was what naming scheme were you gonna call your servers? Like, and that's where the big debate happened. Uh, wh what were we gonna call the servers? Um, and that was only possible because we had limited number of these servers and we really only could count them on our fingers and toes. But we've got a different problem now. And as I said, um, Canary is our new endeavor. Uh, with Canary, we, we've got more than 400 customers, each customer gets their own uh, console. Um, and with 400 uh, instances on, on EC2, we just don't have time for silly names. Like that's not the problem that, that we're trying to deal with now. It's not about naming the machines, it's about managing the machines. So we don't even care what the names of the machines are, it's really how we, we name them. And uh, Soylent is there because that's the dumbest name for a piece of thing out of a startup that I've come across recently. It's just a ridiculous name to call a food uh, a food uh, supplement thing. So in trying to deal with this problem of managing servers, there's a few options on the market. Um, there's Ansible, there's Chef, there's Puppet. Uh, we came across SaltStack, uh, and this is the one that we've gone with. And it uh, basically has given us the ability to configure and manage our machines. It's uh, six years old, open source. It's Python-based. Um, but really for us, the key thing is that it's super extensible. Um, in truth, the choice was quite arbitrary. Uh, as a, one of our guys had been playing with SaltStack um, and said, let's think about this when we started getting into Canary, um, and it's really been for us uh, quite a win since then. 
Um, by a show of hands, who's actually worked with salt? Okay, and who's extended salt? Like who's written modules or any of that stuff? Okay, a few people. Um, but for those of you who have used salt and haven't extended it, then certainly there'll be stuff here to learn. Um, as I said, SALT has already been covered previously at PyCons in 2013 and 2014. There were two talks. Mostly those talks dealt with SALT from an operator's perspective. So how do you use it to uh, manage your, your actual machines? Specifically what we're talking today is about extending SALT. But before we do that, I need to give you some context because not everyone here has used SALT before. And so if we just dive into how to extend it, then you're going to be a little bit lost immediately. So one of the key things that sets SALT apart from uh, uh, say something like Ansible, is that Salt has this notion of an agent that runs on every server in, in your fleet. Um, and so it's this agent-based uh, system where uh, what we call a Salt minion runs on every one of the servers that you're trying to manage. So you have a fleet of 400 servers. Every one of those servers has something called a Salt minion which runs on it. That's an agent. It's a daemon that runs constantly. And it talks back to a central configuration server called the master. It doesn't talk directly back to the master. There's a, a Zero MQ well, they actually do talk, but the, the point is that there's a, a zero MQ bus that sits between them um, and stuff happens, the master will put stuff onto the bus, which the minions pick up, the minions send results back to the bus, which uh, the master then processes. Um, and what it actually sends down are state files. And a state file in this instance is just a text file um, which declares what the state or the configuration of a particular minion should be. So on the master, you can create a text file that says, uh, install a particular package. The master pushes that to the minion, and on the minion, there's this agent that's running. It knows how to convert this declaration that says, make sure a package is installed, to some local action that will actually install that package. And what we've got with uh, Salt is it runs across a bunch of operating systems. So you can generically say, install a package, and then on the minion side, Salt figures out on FreeBSD, I need to use ports, or on Ubuntu I need to use apt, or on Red Hat I need to use yum to actually do the installation. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, funkiness that you can do with targeting particular minions, but we're not going to talk too much about that. So if we get really quickly into what our uh, uh, like a broad overview is, as I said, the master will send through a job, um, it gets the bus, that gets to sent to all of the minions, the minions will do some work, they <laughs> produce results, and those results get sent back to the master, right? So this is a super simple uh, overview on what uh, that structure looks like. That state is defined in these text files. I'm, again, not going to dive into specifics on the text files. It's not what the talk's about. Um, but the essence of it is there are a bunch of nested YAML files, and you can also have some ginger in there if you want. Um, this is an example of uh, one of those state files in sort of a third of the way down the screen. You'll see there's uh, webserver.sls, and it says here, I need to take a Redis server, get it running, I need a Flask server, and it should also run. So that, this particular state file, uh, it's just a, a YAML declaration, um, but when that gets applied onto a minion, it will ensure that both Flask and Redis are running without you having to know too much about that. So if I look at how we at uh, Things use Salt, we basically use it in five ways. So the obvious way is to manage all of our uh, the operating system stuff, make sure packages are updated, kept, uh, kept patched, um, file permissions and all of that stuff. We also deploy our application uh, through Salt. So the way when we've got new code to push to uh, one of our minions um, or to all of our consoles, uh, we will do that via Salt. We also use Salt to gather statistics from our minions. Um, and, we'll, and that's really where some of the custom modules come in. Uh, we also, as I said, our actual product is a hardware appliance that we ship to customers, and we've got the ability to control those uh, devices through Salt. So from a central, the central Salt master, we can push updates to devices, um, but that goes via the console. So the Salt master says to one of the consoles, do something with one of your devices. The command goes out to the console, the console sends that on to the device. And then lastly, we use Salt to enable and disable uh, feature flags um, on our consoles. <laughs> so what that also means is then how do we actually manage the Salt states themselves? How do we update our Salt? How do we uh, push new Salt states to the master? Um, and it, it used to be the case that what we would do is directly edit stuff on the master. 
then we got more developers and that started becoming messy and then uh, we had local Git repos which we would rsync to the master but everyone would rsync it kind of whenever they made changes and if you forgot to commit or forgot to pull code from the repo and rsync an old copy, it's just a mess. Like with a few developers on salt, you quickly get to the point where there's a mess and there's a better way to do that stuff. So what we've got here is a, a developer. They make a change to one of our uh, salt files um, and we've got, uh, we've got the salt master running uh, in the system as well. So this developer commits and pushes some code, a change to the salt state into the repo, and in this instance, uh, salt is configured to pull changes directly from the git repo. So it means there's only one single source of truth here, which is that git repo that the master pulls from. So anyone can commit to the repo, um, the master will only pull stuff from the repo, and it pulls and gets that. Once that state, once the master has those latest states, then an administrator can come at a later point and tell the master to distribute the states to all the minions. But it means everything goes via that Git repo, and that's important. We'll come back to it later with uh, testing. So that's a little bit of the background. Uh, we're going to look at a really basic salt setup here, and this setup has one master and three minions. So one master, three minions. Each of the minions has a Flask web app, and each of the minions must run Redis. And the little web app that we run there. It's just a toy example, but it keeps track of the number of times people have hit the website. Um, so we're going to step now into our first demo of uh, Salt. Right, so let's look at a quick first demo. Um, we'll show the basic files that are required to get a Salt master up and running. Um, then we'll just deploy the state files first to one of our minions and then to the rest of them. So as Mark said, these state files will get a Redis and a Flask server up and running. So in the demo, um, the top console is the salt master and the bottom blue console is one of our minions. Um, so we'll first take a look at the contents of our state file. So this is the top file, which references the web server state file, and that's the important one we want to be looking at. So as we've seen earlier, this basically has two instructions that tells the minion we want our, flask, our Redis server to be running and also our um, small Flask application. So in order to um, get these running on our minion, we will, oh, so uh, it's very important to test that we can communicate with our minions first and we can use a small built-in command in Salt and we can ping them so we can communicate with them. Um, so first we'll list the processes that are running on one of our minions, and you can tell here that neither Flask nor our Redis server are running. So let's change that by deploying um, our state files, and this is done by running the high state command, and we get this pretty output um, saying that everything went okay. And on this minion, Flask and Redis should now be up and running. So if we want to make sure that these services are running on all of our minions, uh, we can do that. Um, so this just double checks that, okay, we indeed are running Flask and Redis server is just above there. So as I mentioned, we can get these services running on all of our minions and we just use uh, star and they should now be running on each of them. To check that, we can open our browser and navigate to each of our small web applications. And this web application basically just lists the number of times that the web page has been hit. So that's minion two, it's been hit five times, and minion three will also have been hit five times. So the power of salt is really visible uh, when you want to make changes to your configuration files. So if you want to add um, software to be installed in your services, that's uh, on your minions or servers, that's very easy to do. If you want to launch new servers, uh, services on your minions, that's also easy to do. And deploying code uh, across your server fleet is also um, very, very basic. Um, so the previous demo showed how to get a basic state up and running. Um, but consider we'd like to install HTOP on um, our fleet of servers. So to do this, it's literally two lines of code, and we'll see that now. So we can go ahead and edit the web server states file. And we'll specify that we want HTOP installed. 
and we use the syntax package.installed, and that's all it, all it takes, two lines. Um, so we'll double check that it isn't installed on our minion already, and it isn't. And again, we'll call high state, which will push that um, states change to our minion. This may take some time as each minion needs to download the package in the background. So it turns out that one of our minions here did have the package installed already, minion two, and Salt is smart enough not to download that again. Um, so there we go, minion one returns successfully, and if we run htop, it is indeed installed. Okay, so that's the basics behind Salt. So we're not gonna talk any more in terms of basic Salt uh, configuration or ideas, and we're now gonna move on into the uh, sort of more nuts and bolts of the stuff. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on uh, some of our usage of salt and some of the notes that we've sort of come through um, and we'll touch on bootstrapping salt, upgrading and some of the failures that, that we have seen. Um, there's a few ways that you can bootstrap salt. There's a salt SSH technique which will SSH in and do stuff for you. Um, we rolled our own when it came to this and so uh, we've got literally new console.sh because if you're not using bash like it just feels wrong. There's got to be a little bit of bash somewhere, especially if you're doing sysadmin stuff. Um, and so we've got this uh, shell script that uh, will basically talk to, because we deal primarily with uh, Amazon, our shell script will talk to the, uh, the EC2 uh, API. It'll boot up an instance. Um, it'll then SSH in and sort of initially just get a, a little bit of salt <coughs> up and running, just enough configuration to get salt up and running. The other reason that we do this is we also need to do configuration on, uh, on AWS. So we need to install DNS entries and make changes to the EC2 instance. And we don't want, the, the, we don't want to put uh, Amazon credentials on our end consoles, our, the, the consoles that users actually touch. Um, and so if we keep that stuff all on the master, then we can avoid uh, having to worry about AWS credentials on customer consoles. But the end result of this whole bootstrap process is we get these little baby minions that are uh, booted. <laughs> so in terms of upgrading salt, the one, I, I guess the, the one thing I'll just add here is uh, at some point we found that one of our machines, or the master specifically, was using the salt PPA to keep track of the salt packages and the minions were all on uh, the, uh, the, distri the Linux distribution's default repo and they diverged in versions. Um, and so just keep those things on the same version number, otherwise uh, funny stuff happens. Um, and so in this instance, we deal just with the, we change our machines to point to the salt stack PPA rather than to rely on the default, in this case, Ubuntu uh, salt packages. I don't know how often people talk about failures of stuff, but I find it useful to talk about where stuff doesn't work or where stuff breaks. Um, and in this instance, there's a bunch of ways that you can get breakages in salt. The obvious one are when your states or your recipes have syntax errors, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, if you're writing code or extensions, obviously that code can also cause breakages, although for the most part, salt is quite smart at uh, not letting your broken Python take down the rest of salt. Um, but <laughs> the one lesson that we learned was that uh, when you have 400 servers all trying to pull from a, a Git repo at the same time, like the Git repo is not so happy with that, um, and then your deploys take like an hour uh, just to download code from Git, um, where normally they take 20 seconds. Um, so Salt's got a few ways to deal with that. The one, the easiest one is you can batch out jobs. So you can just say 10 minions at a time do your thing, um, and that's sort of the, the cheapest way. Alternatively, you can build your actual code into some sort of package and deploy the package from S3. Uh, there's a few ways, but the one is, uh, the point there is just, um, you need to consider, if you've got lots of machines, how you're going to actually deploy your code. Uh, obviously, if you've got network issues, um, there's not much that Salt can do about that, but you will see errors there. Um, and the, one, the, the last one I'll actually mention here, which is worthwhile, is we were seeing an error with Salt where uh, Salt wasn't able to restart our UWSGI process when we had updated code. So we'd push changes, Salt would restart UWSGI, or tell us that it restarted UWSGI, but it hadn't, like if we browsed the site, whiskey was not running, it was down. Uh, it turns out that salts uh, uh, under the hood, and this is where it starts to become interesting, under the hood, um, salt was calling upstart, so the Ubuntu upstart uh, system for managing services, and upstart wasn't restarting whiskey correctly. Um, but not frequently, like one in 20 restarts would fail. Um, and so we switched to an alternative way 
So that takes us now into uh, the module stuff, the actual meat of this talk. Um, and we're first going to talk about uh, executable modules. There are a bunch of other module types inside of SALT, um, and we're literally only going to be talking about three of them, um, executable modules, reactors, and um, runners. And if, if we're going to talk executable modules, again, I think the high-level view is, is worthwhile just to get your mind around what you're actually going to see when Max shows you the code. And so what we've got here is a SALT administrator, um, and we've got a master, and we've got a minion on the other side. As part of that git deploy, we've pulled down uh, what we call an executable module, and that's just Python code. So that's just a Python module which sits, um, and it, its primary place where it sits is on the master, but that's not where it runs. It doesn't execute on the master. The master is just the repository for that module. When the administrator says to effectively what it's saying is please deploy the module, um, the master then sends that module to the minion. And now the code sits on the minion side as well. Uh, again, the primary copy is here. This is just a, this is a secondary copy that happens um, when you deploy the code. And so with that Python code on the minion, what the administrator can now do is call a function in that Python code that sits on the minion. And that function call gets passed down to the minion. It does some work. Um, and that work hopefully has uh, some sort of result which gets passed back and displayed to the user. So that sort of gives you a high level overview of what an executable module is. Python code, which runs in the minion, but the administrator can uh, call that function across their fleet and get access to those results. Right, so there's uh, four main bits when de uh, to remember when dealing with exec modules. Uh, so the module code is stored on the salt master. The master distributes the module code to minions with an explicit push. Um, the master can call the module function on the minion um, and the code runs on the minion and the exec module functions generally have quite helpful documentation which you can have a look at with the uh, D flag. Right, so this is a um, toy example of a module. Uh, here we import the salt uh, Python module and define a function named some function and it just returns a string. So in our third demo, uh, we're going to add a trivial module to the master, distribute it from the master to the minions, call the salt module, and uh, the function code will then execute on the minions, and the results will all be returned to our salt master. So here our module name is thinkst, and our function is hits, and hits basically just grabs the, that hit count we saw, early, uh, saw earlier from the Redis database and returns it. Um, so just a reminder, the hits count is the number of times the web app had been viewed. Uh, so let's go ahead and add this Python code to our master. And we can save it. And we can then list the module's uh, function doc strings with our D flag. And once we're happy there, we can now um, distribute the code to um, one of our minions. So we're just going to distribute it to one to begin with. And that's done by a calling sync all. So now the module resides on minion one. And to call it is as simple as this, thinks.hits, and we get the number of hits in that uh, minion's Redis database. So if we want to push to all, it's similar and calling the hits function on all of our servers is also very straightforward. So our hits function merely returned a value from the database, um, but we can easily pass arguments into salt functions from the command line. Uh, so salt functions can take positional arguments and optional arguments. In the next uh, demo, we'll extend the module by adding a function which simply returns its input argument. So here our function name is echo, and it simply takes uh, one parameter text and just returns it. It's pretty straightforward. We can see our doc string there is returned with the D flag. So let's go ahead and add that to our modules file. Remember the modules file lives on the master. And we can go ahead and distribute our changes. First to one of our minions. 
for completeness, we'll list the documentation. Okay, we're happy it's there. And now we can go and run the module function. The difference being here is now we can specify the text parameter. And it's just going to be, this is a test. So that gets sent to the minion, and the minion returns that back to the master. And we can run it against all of our minions, and a similar result. OK, so that idea of running code on uh, the minions and, 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 write and writing your own code on the minions uh, starts to become quite powerful. Because as I said, we use that now for configuring not just the server, but also for configuring um, our software. And so we use Salt now primarily as a configuration management also for our application. And it's really, I think it's really easy to get into. There's a few ways that you can go about it. And so I guess this is just some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, so the one option is um, that with the demo that Max just showed you, we've got a salt module um, which is reaching directly into a Redis database and manipulating values directly in the database. But that's bad, right? Because it means the salt module has to have knowledge about the database schema. And if the database schema gets updated in the application, then at some point someone has to come back and also change the salt module. Um, and so ideally what we want is some kind of API or some sort of abstraction between uh, our actual changes that need to be implemented in the application and how they get affected um, both within the application but also from salt. Um, and so we really want to reuse parts of our application. We don't want to have to rewrite lots of that management code inside of salt. If we already have that management code in our application, we just want salt to get access to that. Um, and so the obvious answer here is we can try and massage the imports, right? So what we, what we want to do now is we want to take our salt module on the one side, and on the other side we've got uh, modules which exist within our application that run on the server, and we want to call some of that code from the salt module. And Max is going to show us how we do that. Okay, so um, on the left is a module in our test app which modifies the database. So it has um, knowledge of the database schema. And on the right is our salt module. And instead of embedding the database scheme um, in this function, we're going to uh, sort of massage our input paths at the top, which will allow us to import module uh, modules from our test application. So the next demo will show us modifying the input paths and have the salt module run and return uh, values from non-salt application code. So keep in mind that the queries.py code is not part of our salt, mo salt module, but will import it and access its functions. So at the top, we've massaged our input paths. Now we can import modules from our test app. And this example then imports our queries module. And our queries module simply gets the hits data again from our Redis database. And it returns hit. And we have this other um, entry in the dictionary that says this is from the queries module. So we can go ahead and add this code to our modules file. And again, this is on the master. This lives on the master. So we can save that. And we're going to distribute the module code to minion one again. And again, for completeness, we'll list the documentation. And then we can go ahead and run our new hits to function. And it returns as expected. And location, this is from queries app, so it's not run in the salt module. It's imp it, yeah, it imports queries from our test application. So we can sync the changes to all of our minions, and then run it, and we get the three results. Okay, so. We use it in uh, basic, we use uh, executable modules in four basic ways. Um, we gather data from our consoles through executable modules, so we can, at a glance, uh, we've got a function that'll tell us what commit every console is currently running on. Um, we can enable and disable features through our executable modules. On the upside, uh, we make extensive use of it. So for example, we've got custom logs that we can dump uh, to the master. We can push our changes, as I said, to individual devices. 
that exist uh, on customer premises through Salt. Um, we can change um, we can change their settings, um, and we also use them to enable our own security um, within device or within our fleet of servers. We we built a sort of an SSO uh, sign-on uh, process using Salt. Um, it uses that connection. So that takes us to the end of the executable modules. The next up are uh, what Salt calls runners. And runners are basically a level or a layer on top of executable modules. So the basic idea with a runner is um, we want to aggregate data from multiple minions. And you saw with the executable module that uh, Max showed you, when you run it across all of your minions, you get all the output back and it just gets dumped onto the screen. <coughs> Sometimes that data is numeric data or it's data that you want to uh, actually delve into or try to do something with it. You want to aggregate that data. Um, and you can dump it out, of course, to a text file and then process the text file, but you can also use a runner, and the runner is, is quite useful here. So we've got our salt, uh, again, our salt uh, admin. Um, that admin has already deployed a runner to the master here, um, and they're going to invoke this runner. What the runner does is the runner will, as part of its own code, it will, uh, it will invoke modules on the minions, right? So the runner starts, it tells the minions to do their thing. They all start producing uh, output. They send their output back to the runner. And at this point, the runner can do additional work, aggregate data, and um, give some, something more useful back to the user. Right, so this Python snippet captures the essence of a runner. So it's a Python script. Uh, so the runner is a Python script that's run on the master. Uh, so first we get a handle to our uh, to a salt client and we use the salt client to call a module function over a set of target minions. So in this case we are calling the hits to function and the star says we're calling it across all of our minions. Um, then the results are returned from all of them, we iterate over them and then aggregate the data. So in demo six our runner will will use our runner to determine the total hits count across all of our um, minions. So the total hit count is the total number of times all the pages have been viewed. Right, so it's called total hits. Um, we get a handle to the client. The client calls the hits to across all of our minions. We get the results, we iterate over them, and we calculate the total hits, and then we just return that. So the um, so the runner sits on the master to reiterate. We're going to go and create that file now. And we're going to save that guy. So there's no syncing out involved here, because as I've said previously, this runs on the master. And we'll use the salt run command to call to that function. And the aggregated data is returned, and it's 16. OK. So that again takes us through runners. Runners are the way that we aggregate data from uh, the many minions that we've got. The final one that we found to be super useful are reactors. And the short version of reactors are they're just event handlers for things that happen inside of salt. And so sometimes, for example, you want something to happen when one of your minions starts up or when it shuts down or a job is created. And it's within salt modules, uh, modules can easily create new events. It's not a hard thing to create a, an event in, uh, inside of salt. Um, and so specifically for us, we want DNS entries to be updated when, uh, when a minion or when a console starts up. We know it starts up when the minion starts up. So when the minion starts up, that triggers something on our side, uh, a reactor, and then we update uh, DNS stuff there. And so um, again, like that concept is quite straightforward. What we've got here is in the middle, there's a reactor, there's, and that's code that's continually running, and it's monitoring the event bus. Um, we've got a minion on the side, and on this side, we've got, uh, we've got Slack. Um, and so at some point, uh, possibly uh, an administrator boots up a, an instance or they reboot an instance or it restarts. What that does is the minion will send a start event. The reactor sees the start event. The reactor can then perform an action once it sees an event, obviously, and that, that could be uh, make a post request uh, to Slack. Th there's a few ways that that reactor can run. So it can run as part of the main master process, or it can run as an external daemon um, we've tried a few of these, to be honest with you, um, in both ways we've seen uh, salt not uh, pick up certain events. 
So like where we knew a, a, a demon or we knew a minion had restarted, our reactor didn't see it. Um, so I don't know what the cause of that is, uh, but it, it means we're a little bit more cautious with the events in SALT. We don't always seem to see all of the events, and I don't know why that is. Um, so Max is going to take us through a reactor demo. Right, so the reactors take a little bit of config to get going. Um, so our approach is to launch them as part of the master salt service. Um, and that's what the top bit of config does. It says when, we, when, the, or when the master sees a start event, um, run the start state. Uh, and the start state triggers a notify method and passes through the uh, minions ID. So this is the notify function, and it simply posts a request to Slack. So in the next demo, we'll set up a reactor that posts to Slack, um, so whenever the minion starts up. So the master config is already in place, as well as the notify function, so we'll just add the sort of the glue states file to our master. So note that this all happens on the master. Uh, when the minion's salt service is restarted and it starts again, it sends the event to the master, which triggers the notify function. So here is the reactor settings in the master configuration file. So just to reiterate, it says when a minion starts, defer to the start state file, and that triggers the notify function and passes through the minion's ID or name in this case. And this is the notify function. Um, it simply just makes a post request to a Slack web endpoint and passes through the minion's name. Right, so we'll go and add that glue states file. And we can head over to our minion2 and restart the salt minion service. When it comes back online, it'll send that start event through to the master. And we should see a notification come through on Slack. And we have Minion2 has been restarted. OK, so those are the three uh, basic um, building blocks that we use, executable modules, runners, and reactors. Um, we'll touch super quickly on some of the, the lessons learned that we figured as we built uh, <coughs> this part of, uh, of Salt. Um, so output formats, it's quite easy to fall into the trap of just returning formatted strings. Uh, avoid it if you can, and just return the basic type. So if, you ret if you've got a count, return the integer. If it's a Boolean value, return the actual Boolean value. Um, on the master side, Salt's quite smart at uh, when it actually outputs, or when it formats the output for you, um, you can pipe it to a bunch of different formats. And if you have the native types, it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, you also get access in your modules to a bunch of built-in stuff with insult. So uh, this is kind of fun, um, just from a, uh, when you're actually building them. So what we're calling here from our, so this is one of our modules, through a double underscore salt double un underscore, there's, uh, you can get access to the Redis module and its save method. That's the salt Redis module and the save, met the save method with within the Redis module of salt. And the same here, the cp.push is salt copy, uh, copy module. And so what we're doing here in essence is we're dumping the Redis database to disk and then we're copying it from the minion to the master. But we don't have to implement that code. We can just reuse what's already present in other salt modules. Similarly, I'm not going to talk about pillars and grains. Um, like if salt has one failing, it's the nomenclature that it uses. Um, th these effectively refer to configuration data, but you get to, you get to access that config data in your module. So you can know if you're running on a Red Hat machine or an Ubuntu machine or whatever. You can figure that out at, uh, at runtime. Um, and then in terms of debugging, we've got two slides here on how to debug the minion modules. But in, eff uh, in effect, it comes down to different ways to get uh, debug logs. And so the one here is um, you can just bump up the log level of the minion, so the minion logs by default to disk. Um, you can bump up that log level and then in your own module use regular Python logging and then that gets dumped out to var log salt minion and you tail that. And for the most part that works for us. You can run the minion in the foreground but we tend not to have to go there. Um, salt call is one other way that you can debug modules uh, but it's really a temporary thing. Um, we tend not to go that route. I will touch on doc strings just for a bit because the doc strings we find are super useful. So when you 
as Max showed you, the minus D uh, prints out whatever the doc string for a function is. And like for the most part, when we actually have to use our modules, we minus D search for the thing that we want to do and we just cut and paste that thing. So you don't have to try and remember uh, what the invocation is. Um, and so like just if you are getting started out with it, uh, put all of the possible invocations of your function as an example, um, you'll thank me later. That then takes us on to the final bit of the talk, which is uh, testing. And um, this is a recent addition for us. Um, and really, we took this from there's uh, folks at uh, Trivago had a really nice blog post on how to test your, uh, your salt states. Um, and one of the reasons why it took us a while to get you, because in truth, if you break your salt, it's generally not a customer facing break. It's a back end break that you cut your salt, your uh, one of your states fails or whatever. And because you're working on it in real time, you can fix the problem there and then. So it wasn't a priority for us, um, but uh, it became more of a priority as we uh, introduced uh, more consistency, I guess, in our process. So what the folks at Trivago show is they basically break down into a bunch of different categories of types of errors that you'll see in salt, uh, in salt deployments. Only some of those are syntax errors. Some of the others are more operational issues. Um, but it turns out that for the syntax errors, we can, we can effectively, uh, without too much effort, uh, and basically with this call, um, we can tell Salt to parse all of the state files, but not actually to run them or execute them. So you just say load them from disk and, and sort of show the stuff for me. Um, and if there's a syntax error, then obviously that fails. Um, and so they show a nice way that you can tie this into a Docker image. So what we've got effectively is a Docker image that has got nothing to do with our production environment. We just pass the Docker image, our state files, it tries to parse them, and if there's a syntax error or another breakage, then we see that error. Um, and so that'll pick up specifically syntax errors um, rather than um, some of the other ones. Um, and so what we can now do is we can combine this stuff with our git. Yeah, so you'll recall earlier that our earlier description of our state deployment was that when we were to make state changes, we would commit them to our git repo. So combining this with Travago's testing setup um, and with a pre-receive hook in the Git repo um, to test any incoming commits for syntax errors. Um, so this prevents any bad states from ever being deployed. Uh, and then the next demo, we'll try to break our actual salt setup with a syntax error. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, just smash my keyboard with our top state file open. And I'll save that guy. And I'll simply try and push it to our salt repository. And we'll see that it indeed fails. And we get a whole bunch of output. And we can even tell where it broke. So it's quite useful. Um, and just to reiterate, this wasn't accepted into our repository. The developer will have to make changes and try and push again. OK, and just to be clear, that was our production uh, salt that Max tried to break uh, and failed. Lucky for him, he's laser job. Um, OK, so that takes us to the end of those eight, uh, those eight chunks in the, in the talk. Um, just, to, just to wrap it up, there's those three things that I really think that we found quite useful in extending salt for uh, managing our application at scale. Um, we've got the execution modules, we've got the reactors, and we've got the runners. Those um, have done us, or done really well for us in the last two years. So with that, uh, we're done. There's the contact info. Um, are there any questions? I have a two-part question for you. First question is, do you make any use of any of the scheduling and orchestration components in your general runs operations? I, I see that you've got some weekly stuff, some log maintenance. Do you make any use of the internals of orchestration and scheduling? Yeah, so, so we don't, so the, the weekly thing at this point is a manual thing. Uh, Jason sits there on a Monday night and that's for sending out a, a weekly email. Um, so we, we don't use uh, salt scheduling, no. Okay. Second question is, you've got a lot of execution modules that you've written. Have you done any, I've seen in your SLSs you do calls to the execution modules. Have you built states on top of your execution modules to instead just render out states? Yeah, uh, no, so, so we don't actually build, so we really use them as um, the, because we use it mostly for configuration management, 
like we want to make a particular change to a particular console. Um, so we don't build states on top of our modules. Our modules we really use as the ability to call some function across 400 servers. That's our approach. So also no pillar driven release management or anything like that? No, so, so on the pillar side, well, no, so we use, we, we use lots of pillar data to uh, generate or to customize a bunch of the things. So we are pulling in stuff from the pillars in terms of our, uh, well, as I say, generating application config files. Um, it probably doesn't quite answer the question, but that's the extent of to which we use it. Yeah, that's where we take the pillar data. Hi there, thanks for this, uh, the talk. Um, two questions. Uh, the executable modules, you were, you were manipulating the um, import paths. Why can't you just, just do a straight import? Uh, so Salt, uh, Salt runs in its own environment. So the virtual environment, uh, or our app runs in a different virtual environment from the Salt. Um, and, and this is the sort of place I suspect where us background as security folks, like if there's a better way to do that, like I'd love to know, because we kind of massage that import path frequently. Um, but from what I can understand, Salt is running in its own environment and our app specifically has a, def a different virtual environment. So yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and the second question, the, sorry, my phone's gone off. Uh, with the pre-commit hooks, could you maybe integrate with uh, like a CI tool, like Circle CI? Maybe that would be, uh, totally. is that a um, Yeah, so, so it happens that this, uh, we don't deploy from CI stuff for our salt state, but absolutely, I mean, that's a Docker image that you can throw in a script and a bunch of CI tools would, would handle that. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, any other questions? Great. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Uh,